safety link for our second presentation in our speaker series. Today's presentation is called Child Passenger Safety, Buckle Up, Tool Toolkits and Resources. And this will be conducted by Child Safety Link's Health Promotion Specialist, Catherine Hutka. Could you go to the next slide, Catherine? Before we begin, get much further, I'll introduce myself. So my name is Sandra Newton and I am the manager of Child Safety Link. And um, today I wanna go through a few items just before we begin. So we will be recording this session um, and um, I think that'll pop up on your screen. I think it's been popped up, that's great. Um, I'm gonna ask everyone to turn off their mics and their cameras to eliminate any um, unnecessary noise. And uh, to ensure as smooth as possible session, I would like to ask if you have any questions, you could put them in the chat box and they'll be monitored by Mallory Cornelius, our health promotion specialist. She'll be keeping an eye on those and if appropriate, she'll stop Catherine to ask those questions or they might be at the end as well. And you can ask questions obviously at the end as well. And Anna, our admin assistant, will be troubleshooting. So if anyone's having any trouble, just put it in the chat and Anna will do her best to help you. Um, Catherine, next slide, please. Before we begin, I would like to do a land acknowledgement. We would like to begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kma'ki, the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We are all treaty people who benefit greatly from the shared resources of this land covered by the treaties of peace and friendship. Next slide, Catherine. Before we begin, I would like to provide you with a very brief summary of Child Safety Link. Child Safety Link is a maritime wide, sometimes Atlantic, child and youth injury prevention program of IWK Health. We're dedicated to reducing the incidence and severity of unintentional injuries to children and youth. Child Safety Link is committed to working with community organizations, governments, and other partners to ensure children are as safe as necessary at home, on the road, and at play and at school. Our home Focus, our homework focuses on falls prevention and poisoning prevention. On the road, work focuses on child passenger safety, which you'll hear a lot about today, as well as pedestrian safety. The at play work focuses on concussion prevention, as well as playground safety and ATV work. And at school, this is going to be a new focus for us in the future, and this work will address all of our topics um, in the school context. We hope to get a better sense of the work we will do with the schools in the new year. Uh, next slide, please. This November will mark our 20th birthday. We launched Child Safety Link on November 20th, which was International Day of the Child. And to celebrate, we decided to host a webinar series to highlight the importance of childhood injury prevention and promote the work of Child Safety Link. As mentioned, today is our second presentation of the series. Thanks, Catherine, next slide. As mentioned, Catherine Hucka will be presenting today. I'll introduce Catherine. Catherine is a health promotion specialist with Child Safety Link. She coordinates child passenger safety in the maritime provinces and sometimes Atlantic when appropriate. Um, she's been a child passenger safety technician since 2009, and she's been an instructor training trainer since 2017. She also has been trained as an instructor in the safe travel for all children since 2017. Sorry, she was trained in 2017, but now she's an instructor since 2019. And she's currently the president of the Child Passenger Safety Association of Canada. And she's done this role since 2014. So Catherine, I'm gonna hand it over to you. I know you have lots to talk about. Thank you, Sandra, and thanks for that great introduction. Let me see if I can change my slide there. All right, so I'm so glad to be presenting to you all today and to share the tools and resources that you can use to support your work to protect children from injury as passengers in vehicles. Um, I had to, uh, I, I have a lot that I could say and a lot that I could talk about, but uh, I decided that we would uh, narrow our focus to just these three learning objectives. Uh, and so for today, we're going to talk about um, how to recognize the importance of child passenger safety and um, and recognize how we can reduce the risk of injury. We're going to be able to identify three evidence-based interventions to promote child passenger safety in your community. And finally, we're gonna recognize where to find additional tools, resources, training, and supports. All right, so to get started, we know that motor vehicle crashes are a leading cause of death for Canadian children and youth, and that they also contribute to many more serious and life-altering injuries. 
So for those of you who attended the first webinar in this series, Sandra looked at the new Atlanta Cost of Injury report that looked at the latest data on injury across Atlanta, Canada. This report includes the cost from a societal perspective, including cost to the healthcare system, to productivity, accounting for the people behind the numbers, the individuals, the families, and communities affected by serious tragedy, um, and highlighted the fact that transport injuries represented the second highest cost of injury in Atlanta, Canada, in children zero to 14 years of age. Um, and it cost Atlanta, Canada $11.88 million in a single year. So that's that's that was in the year 2018, but representing, um, you know, each year, that's how much um, our estimate would be for the cost of uh, of injury um, to children who are injured in motor vehicle collisions to children and youth. Um, and so we also know that approximately 73 children and youth aged zero to 14 die each year in Canada due to a motor vehicle collision. So we want to prevent those injuries and also uh, prevent um, deaths as well as serious injury. Okay, so we also know that these injuries are preventable. And so um, although not all crashes are survivable, many are. So we know that when the right car seat is used properly, the risk that a child could be hurt or killed in a crash is reduced by up to 70%. Um, so we know that injury to children and youth in motor vehicles is preventable. Car seats, booster seats, and seatbelts save lives. So, we also know that caregivers at Atlanta Canada need support to safely buckle their children. So I know this page does say that a recent roadside study, but I will say that it, this, this study was 10 years ago. And so 10 years ago um, in Nova Scotia, we took a look at how children were being transported in Nova Scotia. So we stopped cars and we took a look and we looked in about, uh, we saw approximately 1,100 kids and how they were buckled in their vehicles. And at that time, we saw that 99% were buckled in some way. Everyone loves their kids. Everyone's trying to obey the law. Everyone's doing the best that they can with what they have. Um, but in that same study, what we saw was that 73% of harnessed car seats, so that's rear-facing or forward-facing car seats with a harness, were used or installed incorrectly in a key way. And again, we weren't really looking at uh, we weren't reading manuals. We weren't being, you know, nitpicky. We were just looking at the basics. Was the harness tight enough? Was it tightly attached to the car? Was the tether used? So those those basic key elements. Seventy three percent had a key error in the installation or use of their car seats. Moving on to the booster seat stage, thirty percent of the kids that we saw in booster seats didn't even meet the 40 pound weight minimum uh, to use a booster seat in Canada. So 30% of the kids using a booster seat were not safe to use a booster seat and also weren't legal yet to use a booster seat. And of the kids that we saw that were using an adult seatbelt, 52% of those kids age 14 and under um, it did not fit safely without a booster seat. And of those 52%, and half of them were not legal yet to use um, a seatbelt without a booster seat, meaning that they were not yet nine years old or 145 centimeters in height. Um, so 25% of the kids that were using a seatbelt were not yet legal to do so. So there's definitely room that caregivers need support. So what are the most common errors that caregivers make. So if we took kind of like what we were looking at the previous slide, um, we can see that the most common error is using the wrong type of seat for the age and the weight of the child. And so we want to make sure that care caregivers and parents are using the right type of seat for that age. We want to make sure that they can correctly install their car seat in their car and then finally the correct harnessing. Um, and so those are the most common mistakes. Um, but you know, which brings us to the question, how can we best support caregivers to reduce the risk? Which brings us to our evidence-based interventions. So the first intervention that I want to talk to you about is the booster seat lesson plan. So this program is a part of the Nova Scotia curriculum for grade two. And so teachers can find that, um, you know, under their own resources um, in Nova Scotia for grade two. We also know that it can positively influence booster seat use for this age group. This 20 minute, minute intervention 
I say 20, but it really takes about 30 from the time you enter the building to the time you leave, um, is evidence-based. And it's really well received by children in schools. They do love it when we've been allowed in schools, which hopefully is uh, something that will be uh, true in the future. Um, so this lesson can be presented by a teacher. It can be presented by another adult who's knowledgeable in the key messages of, of booster seat use. Um, and of course, there's also certified child passenger safety technicians um, who can support this lesson in many communities. So our key questions about this are often, who can present this lesson? So a teacher or any adult knowledgeable about the key messages of booster seat use um, can present this lesson plan. And those key messages are included in the package. So you don't need to be a child passenger safety technician. You don't need to need any additional training to present this to a class. Um, it's all there and we're there to support you along the way. But you might wanna consider community partners. We know that police officers, health professionals, nurses, paramedics, firefighters, uh, first responders can positively influence children's behavior, right? These are seen as a, an authority figure for kids. These are the people who know things. They're wearing a uniform, they have a hat, you know, um, and we, we do have evidence that um, these professional community partners can positively influence children's uh, behavior. Um, and there are, of course, also child passenger safety technicians um, that could be a great resource to support this workshop. And, um, and there's also training available for those who want to become trained as child passenger safety technicians if they feel they need that, that added um, education and support to, to lead this program. Okay, so how do we know that this, this intervention works? So there was a study published in the Journal of Pediatrics and Child Health in 2017 um, about the interventional pilot study for this particular program. So the study observed booster seat use outside of a school after the intervention, so which was the lesson plan, and in a control school and found that the booster seat use did increase among students who had been presented with the lesson plan. So what resources do we have to support this intervention? So there are certificates, there's a photo story, um, plus the regular fact sheets and postcards and things like that that you have always been able to order. Um, there's also a poster as well that can, can be put in the classroom as well as the hallway to remind parents and families that their children received this education. This is that added reminder at pickup to use the booster seat. Um, and uh, these are available at no cost and can be ordered through Child Safety Link. And so um, this is something that we, we have funding to be able to support those printing costs. So who was doing this work? Where was it being done? So um, these are the numbers that we received um, in the last year, you know, pre-pandemic. And this is the people who were doing this work and when they were doing it. And so this is how many resources were ordered for these areas each year. So we had, um, generally it was family resource centers who did this work um, in partnership with schools, especially those family resource centers who had a mandate for children um, who were school age, so over, over six years old, um, would go in and do this in the schools. So we had, we, we were sending out 400 resources to family resource centers as a partnership um, in HRM, in, in and around Halifax. Um, we had an additional 400 resources that went out every year through, um, in Sydney and in other areas in Cape Breton through the Cape Breton Family uh, Place um, family resource centers. And then there was an additional 400 that went out um, in Pictou County. So there's a, a small, you know, relatively grassroots um, organization there called Pictou County Babies to Boosters. And they organized and did this methodically through grade two in all of the schools in their area, along with police and, uh, and nurse practitioners and nurse partners in that area. And then we also had a few that happened in and around Liverpool and Shelburne in that area in the South Shore Family Resource Center uh, network, um, and also an additional 50 that happened in and around Digby in different, uh, in different communities each year. So this is not an insignificant number of kids who received this intervention. Um, and of course, we were all sad when we weren't able to go back into schools and these, these organizations weren't able to support this um, during COVID. But we're, we're hopeful that, uh, that we can get running and that uh, you know, schools are, are open now um, for the most part to visitors and people coming in to support presentations.
So here's just a few pictures from uh, the before times, as we say. Um, so this is the one from Pictou County, um, where we have a, a community volunteer who is leading this. She's showing, pointing out to where her hip bones are, her strong hip bones, and where we want of course, the lap belt to lay um, to, to help keep a child safe in the car. And she also had a police partner that day. And then the second photo is uh, in Halifax. This is um, uh, Charlene at uh, the North End Parent Resource Center, and she's presenting to kids in and around Halifax. And you can see they've also made this uh, this booster seat bar where it's a nice visual. Children can walk under it. And if they're under four foot nine, they definitely need a booster seat in the car. And if they're over five point or four uh, four feet nine inches tall, which only five of those 400 kids that they're going to see in grades um, one to three are going to be, um, then they might get a certificate to let them know this is what we're looking for before you move out of the booster seat. So does anyone have any questions about the booster seat lesson plan before I move on? There's a question in the chat, Catherine, just wondering why grade two um, was selected. That's a really great question. So one of the reasons is um, we're, they were looking for an age uh, where the children could relay this message so they could appreciate what was being taught to them. They were old enough to understand the message and they were considered to be young enough that everyone in that class, for the most part, is going to require a booster legally in this province and it's not been long enough. So um, the children in grade two, if they're not in a booster seat, they still remember having sat in one. It's still somewhere in the house. It's not go and buy a booster seat. It's remember that booster seat you might have stopped using a little bit too early. It's still in the closet. It's tucked under the bed. It's in the other parent's car. Um, you know, here's why we need to keep using that. And so that's why grade two was selected, but the intervention did address grades one, two, and three. And so some of the classes were split classes with grade ones and with grade threes. If people are starting it up again, they may want to consider also addressing the grade threes because they wouldn't have got it in the previous years. Um, but in general, what most communities do is they pick one grade, they do all of the grade twos, and then they know that they've done all of the grade twos. And then the next year they would go in and do all of the grade twos again. Oh, and also grade by grade two, almost all of the children will be heavy enough to be able to use a booster seat because they need to be at least 40 pounds to go into a booster seat. So we're not talking to grade primary or kindergarten um, kids who may still require a five point harness. Let me know if there's any other questions, Mallory, thanks. So our second intervention I want to highlight today is our roadside checkpoint toolkit. And so what is a roadside checkpoint? Um, so what it is is um, basically it's an educational check where um, police partners and community and child passenger safety technicians, so those people who've had that training to be able to look at and assess the correct use of a car seat or booster seat, they're going to partner and they're gonna stop cars on the side of the road, the police partners will, and guide them into a safe parking lot where volunteers and you know people who do this work, people who work in family resource or other agencies that need to, uh, that have a mandate to, to support uh, the safe transportation of children in the community and injury prevention. Um, and they look at their seats and they take a look and they assess the seats and they determine if they're safe to use, they determine if the child is in the right seat and if it's being used correctly. And so this toolkit can help you plan this event in your community. Um, again, the intervention is going to require partnering with police, community supports, and trained child passenger safety technicians. But the key point is that both police and the general community are receptive to roadside checks, um, especially those that are proactively promoting child passenger safety. So not an event where we're trying to catch anyone doing the wrong thing or give tickets. We're there to educate, to support, to correct, um, and to make sure that children are riding safer. Um, and I should have mentioned, but the links to each of these toolkits um, and where to find them are at the bottom of the page as well. So what partners are required? Again, police, community supports, and CPSTs. Here's an image um, where we, the last big one that we did um, in Coal Harbor with the RCMP there. Um, and for this intervention, um, we brought together four different family resource centers. And the, the idea was we were going to do all together a different roadside checkpoint in each community. Um, and so that's that this was a, a gathering of several family resource centers and community volunteers. Um, so I will say that training is available 
about four times a year in Nova Scotia and four times a year in New Brunswick for child passenger safety technician training. That training is approximately three days um, and it is also available when funding allows in PEI in Newfoundland as well. We just went to PEI in June. So what supplies are needed? This intervention is going to require some supplies, including vests, clipboards, um, printed handouts, etc. Um, you're also going to need seats to replace unsafe seats. So there are some strategies you could use to reduce the amount of seats that you uh, were going to need to donate, but that is a factor that you're going to need. So this picture here on the right um, is we you know, it was a 2015 roadside check event that we did uh, in Pictou County in New Glasgow and we saw about 115 vehicles and we had a, a really large team that day. And this was how many expired or damaged or the wrong, you know, the expired or damaged car seats that we saw in those 100, 110, 114 uh, vehicles that we saw that day. And so it represented quite a lot. Um, and in that community, um, what they do is they fundraise or have fundraised um, so that they have two or three of these roadside checkpoints a year um, and they're able to have the car seats to give away. So another strategy that you could use to reduce the amount of car seats, and one of my favorite strategies in, in doing this, is to make sure that everyone is aware that this is going to happen. And so, for example, add that, that um, event that we had there pictured on the bottom, um, what they did was they took the four feeder schools that would be represented by that area, the four you know, areas, um, and they took the child passenger safety resources, the postcard, kind of our, our best bang for our buck, our smallest little little resource, and they gave a thousand of them to the school principals in those areas and asked them to distribute them to the families. They also asked them to send an email um, with Child Safety Links information and information to the laws in Nova Scotia and let all of the families know that they were going to be looking in the month of September, um, that police partners were going to be out there making sure that children were safely buckled according to the law. Um, and I will tell you, we replaced many, many less car seats at that particular roadside event because everyone knew it was coming. It wasn't a surprise. People felt better about the fact that we were there in the event. And the other thing about that event was among the people that we caught, you know, we caught doing good, right? They were using car seats and booster seats. And you could tell that there were some kids who were using booster seats who hadn't sat on them in a while. Um, and so most of the things we replaced were actually expired booster seats. That was our big, and the nice thing about ex booster seats is replacing them cost less than $20 for the most part. And so that was a really a way to keep um, the replacement costs affordable. Um, and the other thing I really liked about that is because it was so well advertised and everyone knew that we were going to be there. Maybe we only saw 80 or 100 cars that day. I'd have to go back and look at the stats. But the the car seat and booster seat use was was better, was increased in that in just the people that we saw. And so it's safe to assume there were lots of other people who weren't there that day, who didn't drive by in that particular hour or three hours that we were there, um, who were also riding safer. And that's our goal is to keep everyone riding safer. So there was um, there was media there. They were having a feel good story about police partners interacting with parents and families and uh, and, you know, influencing other people to better use uh, car seats and booster seats as well. OK, so we do have evidence that enforcement checks uh, create community awareness for the need to use car seats and booster seats while also reaching those families who need support. So we know that we do have child passenger safety technicians in a few places, you know, across the Maritimes where parents and families can actively seek that support. But the people we see at roadside checkpoints, they're the people who don't know they need support, who don't know where they would find support. Um, and so we're really finding those people who, who need us. Um, and some, some key factors include um, positive and supportive messaging and that prior communication and promotion is really a key to success. And this is our little feel good news story um, about a particular check that we did in Bridgewater a few years back. So the resources that are available include reference cards for police officers that are available for Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island. You can also find checklists, fact sheets, postcards, and videos in English, French, and Arabic on our website um, and in other languages as well I'll talk about in a minute. And these can be ordered at no cost. So there are supports available there. Mallory, is there any questions about the roadside checkpoints? Not at this time. Okay, perfect. Um, all right. 
So keep thinking up those questions because I am here to answer questions. So our third intervention I wanted to talk to you guys about is our resources to support newcomers. So I don't have published uh, research that I can really um, point to at this point, but I wanted to say I, I have been involved in a research study um, with Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto, where we were looking at um, patients and families who were coming into ER, and we had volunteers who were checking their seats to find out how they were being transported. Um, you know, at this at this particular snapshot, this moment in time, and what they found, while there was generally errors, you know, across all communities, but they did find that um, in newcomer populations, and especially people who have been in Canada for less than a year, especially um, in those who may be here as refugees, and the key factor was families who did not have seatbelt or car seat laws in their home country um, really needed the most help when it came to using the right seat and using it correctly to, to safely transport their child. And so with that information, that kind of um, burgeoning new research that's coming to light, um, we have been working to create uh, better resources to support passenger safety education for families in multiple languages and for families who may experience low literacy and who may speak English and French, but, um, but need those, those resources in an accessible way, including videos. Um, and so these resources um, include a short educational video. Okay, there are three to five minutes, depending on how long it is to speak that language. Um, a, a print resource as well. And the print resources, resources all have um, one language on one side, and on the other side, they can be printed with English um, to support a family where you might be pointing to a resource and you need to know what that says. And so it's kind of like a little bit of a Rosetta Stone where you know what the what the resource is saying on the other side. Um, and, and additionally, we do have a poster with the QR code that will bring you to those resources as well um, that include the, um, the message in their own language with the name of the language underneath so that uh, a family could point to their language um, and you could support them and find the right resources for them in that language. So the basic information that we're providing them is we're really addressing that that key error that error that is using the wrong car seat, not not putting the child in the right stage of seat for their age and and weight and height. And so the basic information that we're that we're addressing here is is your child in the right seat? Okay, that is the question. Many of you will recognize this format from our postcard that we've been using forever. Um, and that's the question we're asking, is your child in the right seat? And so it has whether, you know, how to tell if your child needs to be in a rear facing car seat, a forward facing car seat, a booster seat, or finally on the last part there, um, how to tell that your child is ready for the adult seatbelt with a few little installation and use tips um, scattered throughout as well. But it's a very basic resource. Um, and now currently we have this resource now available in English, French, Arabic, Mandarin, Chinese, Nepalese, Swahili, Somali, and Tigrinya. Um, and these languages were chosen because at the time when we when we sent this request, these were the languages that the IWK spent the most money on to have interpretation in those years and they were also identified uh, by ISANS as being the key languages that they requested. Um, we have a few more languages coming soon. We now have translations for and are working on creating resources in Dari, Farsi, Ukrainian and Russian. And we have a list of languages um, that ISENSE has also identified as kind of like, if you needed to pick seven more languages, what would they be in order? Um, and so they've sent us that list um, of, of newcomers and refugees who are coming into Nova Scotia. Um, and, and basically these languages are coming, they're in the works as funding allows. So Child Safety Link is currently working on getting that funding. Um, the link is at the bottom to where you can find all of the information about the right seat resources as we call them. Okay, and um, then these are available in a YouTube playlist where you can kind of uh, start playing it in English and then you can click along the side on that playlist to find all of the other languages. Okay, does there any question about the resources to support newcomers? Mallory? Nothing in the chat. Okay, perfect. All right, so moving on. Um, I wanted to talk about, oh, here we are. So who can support this work? 
So anyone who's supporting a newcomer family can share these resources. They don't require any special training. They're the basics and they're all, it's all there. And so um, there are additional resources in English that can guide you that are of course on our website. Uh, and we also have a how to use these resources guide that's available on our website as well that can kind of explain how, how you might use these resources to better guide families. Um, in your area and in your community. So in addition to that Child Safety Link, we answer questions by email, we answer questions you know, by Facebook and private message, and we also have a toll-free phone line available um, in Atlanta, Canada um, to support you. So when you're supporting a family, when you're supporting a caregiver and you have a question and you feel like, oh no, this question is beyond my expertise, you can give us a call. So we do answer that phone um, most days from eight to four, sometimes we're unavailable, um, but if you leave a message, we'll get back to you within 48 hours with an answer. Um, and also you can, of course, email us as well. And so we're there to support you in this and you can find more additional resources and other languages as well. One key thing I wanted to say about um, about these languages is that um, one of the reasons is even when you have an interpreter, sometimes that interpreter may not have you know the lived experience may have never been used a car seat themselves may have never used a car seat with their own children uh, you know the concept just might be really new to them and so it was important to us to make sure that um, that the message was already there in their own language to use it when you are working with an interpreter to be able to hand them the resource in their own language to be able to talk to the family um, and to give them a little bit of a better sense of what we're talking about um, when we're talking about using the right car seat. So finally, I really wanted to talk about the resources that we've created to support First Nation communities. So when we first started, um, you know, our, our very first translation project was um, shortly after the the Syrians, uh, the Syrian families arrived in Nova Scotia and we, we quickly were able to access funding through special you know funding sources and we translated one of our how-to videos into Arabic and I was teaching a class and you know we had four um, four uh, ladies who worked at First Nations health centers across Nova Scotia and they said um when are you going to have some resources in Mi'kmaq like we really need resources in our own language as well and I thought you know what I don't have them yet but I I've, I've have a mission and I'm going to work on it. And so we do have, um, we were able to translate the right seat resources and we do have some additional resources as well that are in uh, the Mi'kmaq language. Um, so, you know, we wanted to make sure that we were listening to and really hearing um, our First Nations uh, health partners across the Maritimes. And so we had this clear communicated request. So we have um, the other thing that was asked for was resources in English and French that represented families in their community as well. And so we have created that. Um, they're exactly the same as the the right seat resources, um, but making sure that we do have, um, you know, real Indigenous families um, from across uh, the Maritimes represented in those photos. Uh, and that was another key resource um, in making these resources that we needed was real photos of real families who live in Nova Scotia who speak these languages um, or who come from those communities. And so we were able to do that um, and make sure that we have, you know, diverse families represented in these resources. And so, of course, after we had um, resources translated into Mi'kmaq and we were able to send these out to First Nations health centers um, in a little package last year as a part of Child Passenger Safety Week, um, we had our Wolastikwe communities reach out and say, hey, what about us too? And I was like, you know what? You're absolutely right. And so um, we now do have uh, resources that we have the translation back for the Wolastikwe language and, uh, and we are working on on getting those uh, those resources, um, the interpretation and uh, and all of that complete too. So you can expect to see that in 2023 as we're working on it now. Okay, and here is the poster as well. So we do have the poster and this is the Mi'kmaq language poster again with the QR code that's going to bring you to those resources. Um, and I wanted to see, are there any questions yet, Mallory, in here? 
We were just looking for some phone numbers, but myself and Ashley have put those in, so we're good to go. Perfect. And I, I, sorry, I didn't have that on the slide. I was thinking about it as I was presenting here, but they are also on the bottom of all of the pink and blue resources that you can use um, from Child Safety Link. So I thought I might just take a moment to play um, a section of that video in English so that you can, um, yeah, just just take a little take a little look. So I'm gonna just press play here and see how. This works. I may need to stop presenting for a moment. It's not working for me in this moment. You know what? I'm going to skip that. And if we have time at the end, I'm going to come back to it. Okay. So additional training tools, resources that are available. There is an online on demand two and a half hour training that is currently available for free for anyone who transports children as a part of their job. So that can include um, daycare providers, foster parents, um, people who are transporting children as social workers or um, uh, or access workers um, who are children in care um, across Atlanta, Canada. Um, it's free. It's available online. Just send me an email and I will um, I'll send you a code so that your staff employees um, or whoever you are who transports children as a part of your work can have access to that training. So that was a bit of a pandemic project for me and for for a few others um, where we were home and couldn't do very much else. We created an online on demand training um, and we do you know, although I haven't made a series of slides about it, um, we do have evidence that um, it does improve and increase confidence and knowledge for those who have taken it around the safe transportation of children in their care. Um, also, as mentioned, we have child passenger safety technician training available. It is a three day training and it's available several times per year. Um, I do have one final Halifax course um, that I have just booked um, in October um, in partnership with uh, Mulgrave Park uh, Family Resource Center in Halifax um, with key spaces for those who work in healthcare in HRM. So um, I'm looking at you guys here and uh, let me know if that's a training that you're interested in. And then finally, we do offer the safe travel for all children training. Um, and this is a unique um, two day add on to the child passenger safety technician training um, and it's it focuses on the safe transportation of children with special health care needs and at this time we've been offering it once a year in Nova Scotia and once a year in New Brunswick that's our goal anyway um, and this year we were able to do that and so I do have a training booked for November 24th and 25th and the key people that I would really like to support in that training are um, rehab therapists and occupational therapists who work um, in NSH and IWK uh, throughout Nova Scotia. So that's a training that we're uh, beginning to promote now that's happening in November 24th and 25th. We do have some other specialized supports as well. So we do have supports for well baby visits, um, you know, in primary care clinics across Nova Scotia, but they could be used for for um, well baby visits beyond Nova Scotia. I have uh, sent them to Newfoundland. I've sent them to a few um, clinics in, in New Brunswick as well. These resources, and there's the link. Um, and I've presented as well to primary care clinics about those resources and how they can better use them to support um, parents and caregivers at those well baby visits. And we also have additional training and support for nurses who support the safe discharge of newborns um, and so that I do that four or five times a year for IWK nurses and an additional five times a year um, for those who work in NSH and and throughout Nova Scotia uh, but there's no reason that others from other provinces uh, couldn't join in on that training as well and that's a 90 minute training about um, making sure that uh, newborns and their families are discharged um, and have have child passenger safety education to be able to support um, car seat use. I wanted to include this report because I thought that this is a really key, it has some real actionable items. If you have a role, um, you know, in, in taking a look at how you can prevent child injury, um, this is our, we call it the decision makers guide, but it's preventing serious injuries to children and youth, a guide for decision makers. And it has a great section on child passenger safety um, with, uh, you know, with the facts and with the stats which can be really important when you're changing hearts and minds uh, in your community. 
All right, so here's our conclusion just to kind of reflect on our original learning objectives. So we talked about why child passenger safety is important because it is a, uh, you know, one of the primary reasons that children are are injured or seriously injured or killed due to unintentional injury in Canada and that we can reduce the risk by supporting parents and caregivers to use the right seat and to use it correctly on every ride. Our three evidence-based interventions today, we talked about the booster seat toolkit for school-aged children and the roadside checkpoint toolkit for, um, for, to support supporting families in the community with police partners. And finally, the right seat resources to support newcomer families and also Indigenous communities uh, throughout Atlanta, Canada. Um, and finally, to recognize where to find additional tools, resources, training, and support, childsafetylink.ca. If you do go to additional training, um, there is a slide for training and events. I know I had linked it on previous pages. Um, you'll be able to find all of these supports there. The final thing I didn't mention is I do have a newsletter specifically around child passenger safety uh, initiatives and supports in Atlanta, Canada, um, and you can subscribe to it on that page as well. I guess this is our question and answer moment. Mallory, is there any additional questions in the chat? Not at this time. Oh, I just okay. got one in. <laughs> Ask and you'll receive. Uh, more so a comment. Okay. I'd like to add, this is uh, Sandra, I'm going to put my video back on, is that it's actually Child Passenger Safety Week. Um, and so... It's a child good point. <laughs> child safety and tremendous amount of work. Um, oh, my video is looking funny. Sorry about that. Uh, we're doing a tremendous amount of work around child passenger safety this week. So I would encourage you all to check our social media, um, specifically Facebook, for a series of different posts. And we have a theme called, What's Your Why? And so I would encourage you all to check those videos on social media and also to check our website. I also want to thank Catherine. Uh, you're always such a wealth of information and, and you have so much knowledge to share and I really appreciate that. Um, Catherine is definitely an expert in child passenger safety, not only in Atlantic Canada, but I would say nationwide as well. So thank you for the work that you do. I would say because of this expertise, I would encourage if you have any questions, we'll have a few more minutes. Um, I would take advantage of this moment. Thanks, Sandra. I appreciate it. Yeah, we were able to go on CTV Morning Live yesterday with my daughter and uh, and my niece. And uh, we also went on Global this morning. So it's been a really busy week already. Definitely check those clips out because I was able to demonstrate how a booster seat works, when a child should move into a booster seat, um, and how long a child has to use a booster seat in order to be safe. Okay, well, I do not see any more questions, so I'm just going to wrap everything up a little bit. Again, I want to be conscious of people's time. So thank you for, for attending our second presentation of our child passenger safety, um, sorry, our child safety link speaker series. Catherine will be putting this presentation on our website. Um, we can't do it via email anymore. Unfortunately, the technology failed us and we were not able to do registration. So it will be put on our, our website um, as well. The recording will be put on our website so you can uh, send that to, to folks who might not have been able to make it. Um, I would also like to invite you to attend future webinars. We have six in our series in total, so we have four left. Our next webinar is Tuesday, October the 4th, and it's gonna be on concussion prevention with Dr. Tina Atkinson and Samantha Noseworthy Oliver, and Samantha is a Child Safety Link staff person, and um, we're excited for that one. And then we're also in the process of developing a community of practice. And this is gonna to be to provide a space for open communication and discussion about child and youth injury prevention. So this is still in the works. We are planning on launching in November around our birthday. So we really hope that that uh, will happen. <laughs> um, if you're interested in being on this community of practice list, please email us. Um, and I believe the email is on the next slide, Catherine, if you wanna to go to the next slide. So there's all our contact information, including a link to all the summaries of a summary of all the tools and resources that Catherine mentioned. And I guess before we close out, I'll ask one more time if there's any questions before we let you go a little early.
Okay, well, thank you so much for your positive comments uh, and thank you for joining us. Again, please check out our website for all this information and please keep an eye open for Child Passenger Safety Week activities this week. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great Child Passenger Safety Week.